Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. We're going to finish off um, this discussion regarding uh, David H. Steele's criticism of Louis F. Weir and James White in regard to Daniel 11, verse 36 to 45. We're going to look briefly here first at the correspondence I had with David Thiel. And then we're going to look at some papers of Weir's, how how that's going to go. I don't know exactly. I don't want to look at everything that, that we discussed, but I put it all here in a document. It's not edited. It's a little bit messy. But uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? The dear Father in heaven, we invite your presence here as we open your word together, as we look at what we believe and understand and um, how we relate and communicate with others and the importance of of listening to what people are saying and um, to recognize in ourselves uh, how we react to people who differ in the way that we think and that we can hear your voice speaking to us, that you can correct us, that you can give us um, a loving heart towards others who who we may feel that are attacking us or in, in just disagreeing with us. And we know, Lord, that we all understand very little. And so we just ask that your Holy Spirit can be our teacher and that you can guide us into all truth. Help us to obey your voice in all things. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so so I know Kelly sort of expressed when are we going to be done with, with David David Thiel um, with what you know studying this because uh, it's pretty clear that um, you know there's definitely a huge divide between what David H Thiel is saying and what Louis F Weir and us are saying, but also I think you know part of it is not really understanding um, other people. So one is we can easily make a person an enemy because they think differently. You know, I think Thiel's argument is that, and we see here, so I had originally, so I'll just go through this here. So originally I had just, I read your paper regarding Lewis F. Weir. Do you still hold the view that Weir has introduced a new hermeneutic contrary to Miller's rules, right? So he's going to respond to that. And uh, he says, regarding Weir's problems with church leaders, so this is like halfway down here, I believe he was indeed mistreated. Who knows if he might not have gone off the rails to the degree that he had if only he had been treated according to the principles Christ established. I believe that he abused the spirit of prophecy in his hermeneutics by avoiding Ellen White's recommendations of Smith when he repented. But Weir should have done more to learn about what Ellen White had written regarding Smith's Daniel and Revelation before doing everything he possibly could to ruin the influence of that book. Now, I don't personally feel that Weir was out to uh, ruin the influence of the book on Thoughts and Daniel and Thoughts and Revelation. He's addressing one small part of Smith's thinking, not the entire book. So I don't I don't find a, a dismissal of the book Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation by Lewis F. Weir. Anyway, he says, I believe it was because of Weir and men who agreed with him that the 1944 edition eliminated thousands of words regarding the Ottoman Empire, Turkey as the king of the north, et cetera. And then he has this, uh, that they must have been ignorant of the very knowledge that Ellen White endorsed. So the light... Uh, given was that thoughts on Daniel and Revelation, great controversy and patriarchs and prophets would make their way, that they contain a very message that people must have, a special light given God has given to his people. The angels of God would prepare the way for these books in the hearts of the people. Now, of course, I would agree with that. So I don't have a problem with the book Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation. I think it's it's a very good book for people to read to understand Daniel and Revelation. We only have problems with a bit of it, because for the most part, Uriah Smith is reiterating what we understood as Seventh-day Adventists about the prophecies. Now, obviously, there's there's a lack in the book, his lack of understanding of the 22520s, etc., um, that relate to the prophetic mirror. 
and obviously this section, Daniel 11, verse 36 to 45. But that's not the main body of the book, and that's not the main ideas in the book. And and I, and I find the book, I mean, there are some things about, you know, different points here and there that I would disagree with. But if you're going to give an overall view of what we understand about Daniel and Revelation, it's definitely better than the books that the church puts out now. Right. If you have, um, I guess it, uh, I can't, there's these two volumes, Daniel and Revelation by, is it? I can't think of the guy's name offhand, but, you know, I've looked at some of these, these books, these different commentaries and so forth. So one is they become very technical and very scholarly, or they become um, sort of, uh, you know, very simplified. So they get the ones for the common people, which are really watery. And then they have the very technical uh, sort of commentaries on Daniel and Revelation that, have all kinds of insidious sort of ideas put in them. So, you know, so I would still say probably out of all the books that I've seen on Daniel Revelation, the, the ones that I like the best are Haskell's books and, uh, and Uriah Smith's Daniel Revelation. So Haskell has uh, the Seer of Patmos for Revelation and Daniel the Prophet, I think, is the title of the one for uh, the book of Daniel. So th those are also good. Now, I, I believe, from what I remember from a long time ago, is that Haskell was trying to respond to a request that Ellen White had regarding the Daniel and Revelation, that it'd be good to publish these books of the Bible with just some notes. And I think that's what uh, Haskell was trying to respond to. But I, I still think that, you know, the books, Daniel and Revelation, the, the Bible books, could be published in a way that was uh, more in line with what Ellen White had suggested. And I, I don't know the statement offhand because that was years ago that I ran across it. But so anyway, when we when we look at what Thiel is saying here, I think one is he tends to uh, overstate things a bit and. Uh, it's not really um, a weighed sort of an evaluation of things. It's it's a little too extreme for me of what he's saying and how he's looking at it. It's a very black and white sort of a way of addressing this. So so we know that the books Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith are, you know, commented on as something that we should be selling. So does that say that they are then? 100% correct in everything they say? Well, obviously not. So I tell them this, these statements do not endorse everything in thoughts on Daniel, since it is clear that many positions taken by Smith are not correct. We recently went through Smith's original articles. It's clear that he departs from Miller's rules when it comes to Daniel 11, verse 36 to 45, right? Um, Smith missed many things in his study, things he did not notice. I do not see how Weir's understanding is a different hermeneutic than Miller seems that he understands Miller's rules well and applies them correctly. And then I write, uh, I can address your paper in more detail if you would like. We're going to be studying our paper, your paper on Zoom, etc. Right. And then um, and then Smith's view on Daniel 11, verse 36 to 45, and just a repeat of Josiah Litch's understanding. And then he says, my characterization of we are ought to ought to be disturbing. I said that his characterization of, character, characterization of Weir was disturbing, especially to those who have chosen to accept Weir's characterization of Smith in light of what Ellen White wrote about thoughts from Daniel and Revelation that I shared previously. Now, I don't find that Weir has a characterization of Smith as a person. He's just addressing his views. It is true that Miller does not have 36 to 39 refer to France because Miller did not have all the truth regarding his understanding of the prophecy of Daniel 11. He not only refers to the King of the North as Great Britain and the King of the South of Spain, but his conclusion on the Glorious Mountain was Italy. James White wrote that the Glorious Mountain was America. Uh, Uriah Smith's view was not merely a repeat of Josiah Litch, but it was consistent with that which the Adventists who were not Sabbatarians regarding the Crimea War 
as it related to the Eastern question in regards to the location of the King of the North. Remember that the Eastern division of the Roman Empire considered themselves to be Romans. When the capital was removed from Rome to Constantinople, the site was chosen to resemble that of Rome. So whether that's really a relevant point or not. Okay, so some of this I ended up copying and pasting twice. So then, based on what I wrote there, then he's going to say something. So I'm going to just read what he says here. Okay, see if I can make sense out of this. We may have to remain in this world, here in this world, because of insubordination many more years than as did the children of Israel. But for Christ's sake, his people should not add sin to sin by charging God with the consequence of their own wrong course of action. Now have men who claim to believe the word of God learned their lesson that obedience is better than sacrifice. So he's quoting spirit prophecy there. And then he says, because of that insubordination, much of the prophecies in Daniel 11 will be repeated. So he's saying that when Ella White says the, that Daniel 11 is going to be repeated, the prophecy in the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Much of the history that has taken place in fulfillment of this prophecy will be repeated. He's saying that that is happening because of insubordination. Now, does that make sense to anyone? That that's just because time is delayed. Do you, do you understand what he's saying? So he's saying this, this issue dealing with Turkey and so forth, because that's the part that he's going to have that's going to be repeated. He says it's got to be repeated because we didn't believe it, basically. Okay, now is he saying this or is this the quote from manuscript or letter? No, he, he's saying this. He's saying this. So there's the quote that says, you know, the prophecy in the 11th of Daniel will be repeated, right? Okay. Saying because of insubordination, much of the prophecies of Daniel 11 will be repeated. So he's taking the insubordination quote and the, and, uh, from 901, and then he's, or 1901, pardon me. And then he's taking this, the prophecy of the 11th Daniel from, uh, 1904, right? So these two statements of Ellen White, and he's, uh, saying that because of that insubordination, much of the prophecies of Daniel 11 will be repeated. And I don't think that that makes any sense. So he seems to have this view that if, if we hadn't been insubordinate, then the, you know, Turkey would have already moved its capital to Jerusalem. And so in a sense, this history kind of has to be repeated. So that will happen. That's that's what I would gather from this. Where would the insubordination be the first time? Well, it's definitely not relating to uh, the prophecies of the 11th of Daniel. That's just a statement she makes about the fact that God's people are not obeying his voice. And that so it's nothing to do with history being repeated. She's. So he is applying that statement to some time in in that history when Smith wrote the book. And yeah. He's, we rejected it. The church rejected yeah, it. Yeah. So he's putting two statements together mm-hmm. that are connected. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. So okay. there's, there's no logical connection there. Now, okay. when, when Ellen White talks about the prophecy of the 11th of Daniel, right, she's going to be dealing with that whole history, not just verse 36 to 45, but 31 to 36. Right. That is the history of the papacy, right? So if we find this quote, Stephen commented on it uh, yesterday. So let me see if I can quickly f- find this here. I'll get it from the letters and manuscripts. So it's uh, 1904 and letter 103. Okay, so if we, I'll set this up so you can see this. Okay, we have, you know, this letter here just talking about lots of different things about the work that needs to be done right the medical missioning work and so forth we have no time to lose troublous times are before us the world is stirred with the spirit of war soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place the prophecy of the 11th of daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment 
Much of the history that has taken place in fulfillment of this prophecy will be repeated. In the 30th verse, a power is spoken of that shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. They that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword, by flame, by captivity, by spoil many days. And when they shall fall, they shall be holpen with a little help. But many shall cleave to them with flatteries. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them, to purge them, to make them white, even to the time of the end. Because it is yet for a time appointed. And the king shall do according to his will. And he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. And shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods. And shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. Scenes similar to those described in these words will take place. We see evidence that Satan is fast obtaining the control of human minds who have not the fear of God before them. Let all read and understand the prophecies of this book, for we are now entering upon the time of trouble spoken of. At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. So she's then going to quote Daniel chapter 12. So in connection with this history being repeated, Daniel 11, much of the history connected with this prophecy, the prophecy of the 11th of Daniel, right, has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. So that means it's not completely fulfilled. And much of the history that has taken place in fulfillment of this prophecy will be repeated. And if she's going to start at the 30th verse, Uriah Smith is going to agree with her all the way up to verse 35, right? So, so there, there's no way that you could apply this statement in the way that Thiel is doing that, right? Because the way that he's trying to take this is that this history dealing with Turkey because of insubordination, that history has to be repeated. That is, we have to go through that again. And that's not what it's saying. This is talking about the history of the papacy in connection with the Sunday law. Right? The persecution that's going to happen and so forth. That's right. right? So, so that's how we would understand the state. There's no way we could try to apply this to Turkey. So these are the types, these are the types of problems we run into. Now, I'm trying to find his other quote. Maybe I didn't put that in there. So anyway, I'm not going to go through all of this, but I asked him where he tries to say that I, I, believe myself to be infallible. Say, so, well, where did I say I was infallible? Or how, do, how do you get me as saying I'm infallible? He says, as to your question about where do you claim infallibility, it was inferred the moment you judged me as biased before I wrote my papers, which of course I never actually said before he wrote his papers. But I believe you are mistaken about Smith departing from Miller's hermeneutics, but he does not. He simply departs from conclusions Miller made, not from actual hermeneutics. I already explained to you why Miller misapplied history in his attempts to show how it fits with the literal historical approach of hermeneutics. So this, you know, this way in which we address somebody that disagrees with us. Now, when I've said that he's biased, it was simply, uh, what did I say? If you can find this case didn't show up here. I don't think I copy and pasted that in here. Now, if I say somebody's biased, have I judged them? Yeah, so this part here, I didn't somehow get this copy. Um, so I had said something uh, about Willie White. Okay, so here's what he said. I have attempted to reason with you as for Willie White's recounting his memory. Okay, so this I say this before. Um, so he's going to talk about how what Willie White says. Okay, I'm just going to go here. So Daniel 11 moves from spiritual, from literal to spiritual, since it addresses end times. The false assumption that Smith, Smith makes is to assume that Daniel 11 is continually a literal prophecy. Your method of citing people's opinions 
rather than doing Bible study is not helpful. Do not find support in the spirit of prophecy of Smith's views. You read into her statement something she does not say. Ellen White clearly connects 2 Thessalonians 2 to Daniel 1136. The connection is clear. I see no difference between Miller's principles and Weir's. Smith does not use Miller's rules. Smith simply quotes other people as authorities. This is the Protestant way, not our way. We are still going to go through your paper and address your comments. We're learning a great deal by doing so. Okay, so he says, you accuse me of citing people's opinions rather than doing Bible study absolutely astonishes me. And we went through his paper. Did he do a Bible study? No. 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 Not, not, definitely not line upon line. No, he, he referred to a few verses here and there. But but he's not doing a study. He's not showing why Smith is correct, like from the Bible, right? I gave you all kinds of support from Ellen White's writings for Daniel and Revelation, right? So so obviously he did, he, which we agree with. Just because you rationally refuse to accept them is not anything I have any control over. You are certainly free to go through my papers. Please go through James White's paper as well but I have no faith in your ability to do so with any comprehension of the truth, for you have so openly proven to me already that you are incapable of doing so with a modicum of honesty. Daniel 11 does not move from literal to spiritual. It is consistently literal throughout. Miller uses literal events from history, but misapplied them because he concluded there would be no more history after 1843-44. He was wrong in his conclusion. Ellen White wrote, especially should the book of Daniel Revelation be brought before people as the very book for this time. This book contains the message which all need to read and understand. Translated into many different languages, it will be a power to enlighten the world. This book has had a large sale in Australia and New Zealand. Um, so, so he's just going to give us some more of those quotes again, which, of course, we can agree with. Um, he said, I already sent you this quote and you rejected it then. I have no doubt you will continue to blind yourself to the fact that this is an endorsement. Who is able to help you repent of your unbelief if you reject the Holy Spirit that moved Ellen White to write it? So I would agree it's an endorsement. All I'm saying is that when Ellen White endorses something, it doesn't mean she accepts everything that's written in that endorsement. He sounds he sounds like, like there's a lot of vitriol and it sounds very bitter. Yeah. Well, and, and it could be, you know, like sometimes people have been opposed a lot. And so they get on the defensive right away. Right. It's so like he's been so hurt, you know, he's been hurt yeah. somewhere. Yeah. yeah. So, so I wasn't able to discuss with him, right. I wasn't able to have like a communication with him, as you can see. Right. So, and we have to be careful about that. Right. So, I mean, you're learning about it, Kelly, you know, a bit more about our emotions and how they affect um, our communication with others and even our understanding our, of ourselves. Both uh, our thoughts and our feelings. Yeah. Well, thoughts and feelings are connected. Yes. So some, some, some psychologists actually say that really feelings are just thoughts. Yeah, no. They're, they're just, they're just, they're, they're just uh, thoughts that, uh, cause us to feel <laughs> the, the spirit of prophecy quote partially is to bring our thoughts and feelings under the yeah. control of reason and conscience yeah and if our thoughts are correct our feelings will be correct and that is uh, it, the holy spirit does that but there but we can actually learn how to do that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes definitely but, but I mean, I, I I don't I think without God, it's it's impossible really to see ourselves as we truly are. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, part of what you know I've I've learned through the years, and and God still keeps teaching me this is just how little we understand, how little we know ourselves, and how how uh, subjective we are in. What, how we perceive the world and other people and even ourselves that we're not objective and that God is the objective observer he sees all things, he knows all things and only through communion with him can we know anything right, so, so God is the one that teaches us 
And, and by, yeah. by know, we can know things in the sense that we can believe we know things. But I mean by really knowing things that we can have pure confidence in them. That only comes from God. Yeah. And even people that don't believe in God, the Holy Spirit strives with every man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so even people, you know, before they become Christians or, or whatever, I mean, God is working in their lives and he's teaching them things. There are things that, that they can know because every man can know that God exists from, from the creation of the world. You know, God is seen, right? You know, his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. So everybody has a knowledge of God. Everybody's given a measure of faith, but how we respond to that, whether we're going to want to know God and see our sins or whether our sins are going to hold us back from knowing God. That's a personal experience. But yeah, so when I look at a situation like this, I look at how he's reacting to me. And and I don't think I'm giving him anything to react to that I can see, right? So, you know, maybe maybe it's he's taking me more abrupt than I intend. Uh, when I look at this, my response, I say, well, Willie White's opinion, Arthur White's opinion. This is not a Bible study. You misrepresent Weir's views. I have no problem with Ellen White's support of thoughts in Daniel and thoughts in Revelation. I support his book as well. This does not mean that he is correct in every detail. There's nothing rash about anything I ever do. I'm not a rash person. I am slow, slowly, I am slowly in reasoning. I don't know. And what evidence do you have that Daniel 11 is literal throughout? This is the case. How do we reconcile this with the facts that modern Israel no longer has a place in Revelation? We do not interpret Revelation as literal. So his response is, I have attempted to reason with you. As for Willie White's recounting his memory, this is not opinion. So I'm not quite sure how, how that's not opinion. But anyway, it is recollection of the memory. Still an opinion, whether it's uh, a recollection of the memory. Arthur White's writing is not opinion. It is historical fact, which I have not taken out of context, but have supported by pointing the endorsement of Ellen White in subsequent manuscripts and letters. I've not misrepresented Weir's views. I've critiqued them in light of what Ellen White has written in support of Daniel and Revelation by Smith. You are misrepresenting me by your slanderous accusations. So have I made any slanderous accusations? No. Not, not even close, right? I do not trust you to ha rightly handle the truth because it cuts against the position you hold. So he's saying, uh, you know, he's saying not, I, I don't agree with it. So he doesn't trust that I can, I can uh, rightly handle the truth. The position you hold of supporting weir suppositions and theories are not to be trusted in light of the slanderous accusation of him calling Smith a Jesuit, which we looked at, and he doesn't call Smith a Jesuit. That's that's a complete misrepresentation. Really, Theodore, you are blinded by self-deception that you are all right and that your I. Smith relied upon apostate Protestants and therefore could not possibly be correct. That is your opinion. I reject it as your opinion. You are not a safe teacher to follow as proven by the manner in which you have treated me by our conversation right here. Therefore, I cannot reconcile with you because you are not right. I cannot help you see that you are wrong if you are so persistent in thinking yourself so much more elevated than me because you have concluded that I am biased. You have no right to judge me in the manner by which you have. Please have no further communication with me as long as you attack me and my character in such an unchristlike manner. Okay, so what do we see here? We, we've we see that no, matter what you, no matter what you say, he will take it as an attack. Right. And 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 we have to recognize that, you know, we can shut down communication because. I mean, you know, obviously we would look at what he's saying here it just doesn't it doesn't agree with what I perceive that I'm doing in communicating. So then I try to say, OK, what have I done now to say that somebody's biased? I, I, I don't take that as slanderous because we're all biased. Right. Right. We all have biases. Right. So I was particularly just pointing out that the way that he was approaching it 
uh, his evaluation of Weir was biased, right? He has a view that he's not he's not looking at. He's not looking for, and, and that's the way that I evaluated his paper. That it was it was a biased paper, right? People write biased paper. I write biased papers. We all say biased things, right? But I think it what he has is an overreaction uh, to anything that I did or said. Now, is it true that I, I think that I'm much more elevated than him? I, I don't think that that I think that. Just because I disagree with someone, because I've had this accusation before. Like if you're talking to somebody and you have a different opinion, then what they will do is say, well, you think you're better than me, right? No, they don't necessarily say it that way, but that's what they're they're saying. Like, you know, by disagreeing with the person, are we saying that we're we're smarter than they are? Now, maybe, maybe we can come across this. If anything, perhaps just informed more or differently, but not necessarily more intelligent or smarter or anything like that. It's a, yeah, it's, it's a personal bias actually to even interpret some other people that way. Yeah. I mean, when somebody disagrees with me, I don't think that they think they're smarter than me. I, I don't take it as an attack. If somebody has a different opinion, if somebody has a different view on something. Now, mostly I'm interested to hear what people have to say. Right. So I, I enjoy engaging with people who have different ideas. You can learn from people. Um, also, I want to understand the other person. I want to know why they think something, not just what they think, but what their reasonings are behind it. I mean, that's the reason I communicated with him in the first place. I didn't communicate with him to attack him. I said, we're reading your paper. We're studying it. I invited him to to join in the study, right? And, and I wanted to have his thoughts because I wanted to evaluate his paper honestly, right? That That was the purpose. There's no one-upmanship here. There's no you know, setting myself above him as somehow more elevated just because I have a different opinion, a different view. I want to understand his view and I want to, and I want to do that because I want to understand my view better as well, right? I want to understand what my thinking is. Why do I conclude what I do regarding uh, Daniel and Revelation or anything? That is how we approach learning. Because if I have an opinion, but I don't know why I have that opinion, I don't know even my reasons for what I believe. And especially if those are re- reasons are either emotional or just part being part of a group, it's not it's it's not going to benefit me just having a correct opinion, you know, expressing it if I don't have a basis or solid foundation for what I believe, right? This this is the whole reason that we we pray and we study and we we follow God because we are going to have what we believe being tested and 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 if we don't have a solid foundation for that belief then yeah we you know we we won't be able to stand in that time so every time we have an understanding we we need to have that that understanding challenged and we shouldn't take that challenge as an attack on us personally. But, you know, this also just clo- close, shuts down any type of communication, right? Because sometimes, you know, I want to communicate with someone. And uh, yeah, so there's a little meme there that Kelly posted. Um, you know, sometimes I want to, you know, communicate with the person and they're shut down to communication. And, and usually for emotional reasons, right? And and they will often just, you know, use this sort of language, right? You think you're you're you think somehow that I'm stupid, uh, you don't value what I have to say. And I and I've tried to to figure this out. So I mean I have it happen a lot. And and one of the things is because I'm I I study a lot, I know lots of things. 
But that doesn't mean I think that I'm better than other people. And I'm trying to communicate with people. I'm not just trying to tell people what I think to be true. But we, we saw it happen in the American group back in uh, 2021, right? So you know, back in October of that year, when we had this issue dealing with uh, some of these conspiracy theories, right? this idea that we could become transhuman, which, which I opposed, and that we would actually be owned by the drug companies if we got that they would own our DNA and this, this whole thing of uh, amalgamation and so forth. And it ended up to be, you know, not pleasant, not a pleasant discussion. And, and obviously I, I, you know, use some language I shouldn't use, say, you know, that's nonsense, right? What, and the, the reason why I said it was nonsense, what he was saying is it actually didn't relate anything to what we were talking about. He just, he just listed off a bunch of other things that were unrelated. And that's what I meant by saying, well, that's nonsense. It's, it's not, it's a nonsensical explanation because you're not even talking about what we're talking about. But, um, you know, obviously that didn't work out very well, that, that whole discussion, and I got banned from the American group. So I spent a lot of time evaluating, okay, what had I done? What could I have done differently? And I remember prior to the study, you know, I, I knew that something was afoot, right? So I knew that there would, even before that we got on the study, and I was praying to God, I said, God, you're going to have to help me here, because I have a feeling that there's some kind of, antagonism and I don't know what it is and so I was really not looking forward to to being a part of the study and then Daniel Fontenot was addressing uh, the Catholic Church or somebody was addressing something and and I mentioned something about the Catholic Church and Daniel Fontenot was not happy about what I said he sort of was really you know responded in a way that was kind of surprised me because I could see he didn't understand what I was saying. And then the thing of amalgamation came up and and I expressed what I had understood about it, um, that I'd looked at it and that I'd taken the position that it was amalgamation of man with beast. And then I read more statements in the spirit of prophecy that showed that she was talking about amalgamation of man with man and beast with beast, not man with beast. Because it's the amalgamation of man and beast, right? Not man with beast. But if you look at all the statements that she makes, you can see that she's not talking about mixing human and animal DNA. Um, so, um, but that was not taken very well. So uh, Daniel Fontenot was opposed to that as well. So in the situation with, uh, what's his name? Mark Johnson. Where and 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 then Colin also I think too was dealing with some things, um, statements about the DNA and some document. Anyway, it just ended up bad, right? And so, you know, the question was why? What did I do? So what could I have done differently in that situation? I think probably that the the thing that I could have done is said nothing. That's probably the only thing that I could have done. I don't know what people think or people remember that discussion. But I wasn't there, but you might you might you might have said nothing or had a measured response, but I can get the frustration when people are going how's that, how's that said uh, fan, fanciful fields or whatever. Um so it is frustrating speaking with someone who's so convinced of things that just a little bit of research well it's quickly shown not to be so but uh to say nothing as well could be wrong well yeah to allow so, people to believe error yeah so that you know that's sort of the, the struggle that i've that i faced so so i had that situation then we had the other conflict again on uh, december 25th 2021 with the canadian group study and um, and that was just over me trying to clarify what what Colin was saying. I was actually interested in what he was saying. I believe that that he had light. People took it as if I was opposed to him or arguing with him or something. And and so then I chose for basically a year not to communicate with the Canadian group. So for for about three months I listened, 
but didn't say anything. And then Colin was saying, well, you know, you need to say things. You have all this knowledge, you know, you should share it with the group. And I said, well, you know, anytime I talk, there's, there's always going to be a reaction. Somebody's going to react. You know, even if I'm just sharing something that's in agreement with other people, there's still going to be a reaction. So we can analyze and try to figure out what we could do differently. And I've tried to figure this out with, with David H. Thiel. And, and so I can't, you, I mean, obviously it's easy to see that, that he's defensive. How do I break down those defenses? I mean, to me, in my initial communication with him, I was trying to connect with him, right? I wasn't trying to attack him. But it quickly turned into, uh, for, for him, an attack, right? So now, you know, so we, we talk about this. I ask him some questions. And even here, when I look at this, you know, analyzing, obviously, what, what I was doing, how's Willie White's opinion not an opinion? In a court of law, it would be hearsay. He tried to argue that since we are believed that the gathering begins prior to close of patient, that he is spiritualizing. The statement is pretty clear. He knows that the sixth plague occurs after the close of probation. He is simply saying people make their decisions prior to the close of probation, which is obvious. Do you believe that the Battle of Armageddon is a literal war between nations, or is it, does it represent a struggle that occurs during the time of Jacob's trouble? Where have I slandered and made false accusations? Can you point these out? Weir does not call Smith a Jesuit. You're misrepresenting, right? So even in here, I tend to be correcting him, right? Now, do we correct people, you know, is, is my communication the best? I mean, because he's already had these defenses up, you know, so I say you are misrepresenting. And then I say, I'm open to be corrected. Well, maybe he doesn't think I am. I said, you simply have an odd way of presenting your ideas. I've never attacked your character. I do not even know you. But even in this, I don't think I'm doing a very good job, right? You know, I... I'm not, you know, I'm just thinking, right, that this is the way that I communicate, right? So I tend to be a person that corrects people. And, and that's not, that's not really a best, the best way to communicate. I don't know if any of you have that same problem. Yep. I have something. Good morning. I have something recent to actually I'll get to it in a second. Yeah. But carry on. I'll, I just need a minute. Okay. Yeah, because, um, you know, and I know uh, I can be a bit annoying that way. So. Well, no, Jesus know, when, always answered a question with a question, you know, when he talked with people. Yeah. It was more in that line with Christ. <laughs> yeah. So so I recognize that some of the ways that I communicate can can appear to be sort of condescending, though. Well, I don't a think wise, that, a wise that, man once a wise man once said nothing. <laughs> yeah, well, you'd be surprised at how how little I actually say of what actually goes on in my head. Um, I've learned to you know only say about twenty five percent of what I'm thinking because because I think lots of stupid things. There's lots of things I could say that would not be good. So you have a, you're not you're not alone there. <laughs> Yeah, I know, because things go through our minds that we, you know, we, that we shouldn't say. But, you know, if you think about things before you speak, that's what I try to do. You know, how is this, how is somebody going to be affected? But sometimes, you know, you're writing on social media. It's not the same as talking to a person in person, right? They, they can't see your expression. They can't hear your tone of voice, right? You know, so he could read it. How is Willie White's opinion not an opinion, right? I mean, he could read it that way. In a court of law, it would be hearsay. But, you know, to me, it's just like, well, how is Willie White's opinion not an opinion? In a court of law, it would be hearsay. And then, you know, then I, you, you tried to argue that since we are believes the gathering begins prior to the close of probation, right? Spiritualizing, right? That, so I'm just pointing out something that he said. And I said, this doesn't really make sense to me, right? But in social media, that's not going to come across necessarily the correct way. Yeah, you know me and the memes, I, they say so much, but there is a black and white one. Boys in the backyard have sorting it out and having a fight. And 
in the days before social media when we could hide behind a screen. This is how we sorted things out. And sometimes I think people are in that attitude without realizing it, that they they just want to sort it out that way. This confrontation um, yeah. turns into something that you don't really intend. Yeah, and you're not really dealing with a person in a way on social media to some degree. We can feel we're just dealing with an idea. And I tend to th deal with ideas rather than thinking about the person, even in person, right? But it becomes much more difficult on social media because you just, you know, though, you know, I've deleted a lot of things uh, that, that I've written before I, you know, like I didn't post them. Because I'll read them over and think, well, this is terrible. <laughs> you know, it's not going to help the situation. So, so you had something to share, Kelly? Or I'm trying to remember. Oh, um, about that, the idea of confrontation uh, coming up because of correcting someone, or mm -hmm. even being corrected. Uh, so let's think here. So I did something that, that the little voice was telling me, no, don't, but I went ahead and did it. It was some food that was someone had ordered out, but they left it on the uh, table for like an hour. And I thought, you know, things get thrown out pretty quick around here if they're left laying around. And I thought I didn't want to waste it, justifying it in my mind somehow. But so I ate it and later, later, uh, Oh, later, you know, they confronted me about it. Two guys had ordered it, and I'm like, I'm sorry, you know, I, I was wrong. I, I, I knew I shouldn't have, but I did anyway, and I'm, I'm sorry. And then it's histronics. It's, they go into the history of it every time there's a disagreement. No, oh, you did this. And no matter what I say, yeah. they just don't let it go. They use it against me. And, and uh, yesterday, I confronted them because I was tired of seeing what they were doing, just using people. And I said, well, why are you doing that? Why don't you... That's none of your business, you know. And, and I immediately felt bad mm -hmm. after saying it to them, realizing, you know, it wasn't, well, I shouldn't have said it in front of everybody else because that earlier that day, I'd already confronted them aside yeah. and not in front of anybody i said guys i feel this way i feel used by you so then last night it kind of came to a head and when i said and tried to come between them and someone else they were trying to that they were taking advantage of and, and they got quite upset and they came back later and we worked it out but i said okay please stop I know I am wrong, and I am sorry. And I left it at that. I didn't try to explain myself or point out where they were wrong or anything. I just said, I'm I'm wrong. I'm sorry. And I think sometimes to, to well, the counsel is, you know, we don't have to recount where the other is in error. Mm -hmm. we, uh, you know, we just own our part and be quiet. Yeah. Well, and that's what I did you know, after this situation with the American group and even the Canadian group, I just apologized for what I had done. Didn't make any excuse for it because I don't think there is an excuse for it. But um, we need to, we need to, in communicating with others, we need to figure out the part that we have to play in that. Because it's easy just sort of to blame the other person for the lack of communication. Now, it could be true that they have a part to play, right? But I have no control over the part that they have to play. I only have control over the part that I have to play. And so, you know, we need to figure out how can we communicate with people, especially those that, that you know, we have problems with. And we can't always solve those problems. That is, doesn't mean we're going to be able to communicate, but we can learn about ourselves. And... You know, and of course, this is not about psychology here, we're not in psychological study, but we are trying to understand what it means, like how Christ communicated with people. 
you know, there are times, you know, scribes, Pharisees, hip, hypocrites, you know, whited sepulchers. I mean, there's a time for that type of language, you know, but that's not, a, and especially when you're dealing with a person one on one, to be able to reach that person and communicate with them, it takes the Holy Spirit and it, and it takes, it takes it, it, we have to have a Christ like character to do that. Okay, so what we have in front of us now, this is, um, uh, this is the a book by Lewis F. Weir, uh, Kings from the Sun Rising. And uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing here. So, but he's going to deal with the Eastern question here. So many false forecasts have been occasioned by the Eastern question. Yes, and many loyal Seventh day Adventists have made false forecasts due to their belief in the Eastern question. So this, this is a fact that there's, speculations that have been made because of the Eastern question. Our day in the light of prophecy has some of that in it, that book from 1920s that my grandma has or had. And, um, you know, so these, these things exist, right? That is, and we see it today, not necessarily the Eastern question, but based on the same sort of principles, where people are looking at what's literally, they're interpreting prophecy. Literally, uh, they're interpreting using the Protestant means of Bible interpretation. And they're looking at current events and making predictions. And, and we're not to do this, right? We need to understand the prophecies and, and what those waymarks are. And we've been given, this movement has been given, an understanding of line upon line. So, we can know that Trump's not going to bring in the Sunday law, not because, you know, of how we feel about it, but because of what prophecy says. We're not in that time yet. There are events that have to occur before the Sunday law comes. And so Trump is not the one to do that, that, that we know, right? So... Mm -hmm. So but yet people are going to believe that. that Trump's going to bring in the Sunday law because, well, it just seems to fit. What, what did you say, Kelly? I'm pretty confident of that. that it's, he is not. Yeah. Really based on based on history of so many presidents, so many Seventh-day Adventists have said it's going to be this president. And yeah, but it's not just that. It hasn't been. Yeah, but it's not just that. The thing is, it's not really even about a president, right? We, we right. see that the Sunday right. law is a grassroots movement. Now, people well, can say, I think, I think the way they there. think, I think the way people may be thinking this president, because it will be a grassroots movement pushing him and they're looking at him as someone who wants to help or support the grassroots. Okay. But we see such division in the United States right now. So it's not like 51% of Americans want a Sunday law, right? Right, yeah. It would be very difficult we, to get through. Right. So Impossible, what, really. Yeah. What you need is a consensus for a Sunday law. Well, yeah. What was the uh, change to the Constitution that requires, what was it, three quarters or something of the states yeah, to agree? Like yeah. I got a I got I got a coworker that I was talking to about the Sunday law, and I told him I said it's going to be a Sunday law, short so coming soon, and he said no, it ain't going to never be no Sunday law. So I can I, I can see where you're coming from because most of them don't think it's going to be one. And this generation as well, my son and his friends, they just say that's impossible, Dad. Uh, our our generation don't even believe in God and the church, so they can't see it at all ever happening. Right. So obviously there has to be a major change in in the world in the world's thinking. Right. Now we could just say, well, there's going to be a disaster, right, or some calamity, a third world war, or something, economic collapse, something that's going to just be a catalyst. But there is more that has to happen than just that. So one is we, we need to see 
where that where that fails is that there have been a lot of catalysts. First World War, Second World War, 9-11, Cold War with Russia and, and the states in Cuba. Uh, there's been so yeah. many. Yeah. 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 So so obviously, and we've had economic collapses. Now, maybe not as drastic as what you know you need, I guess. But, you know, the Depression in the 30s, that was kind of an economic collapse, right? Yes. Right. Well, so obviously, someone, was, so, someone mentioned it before. Uh, a sister there, India, China, and Russia, is it, are mentioned also? In in where? India, China, and Russia. Uh, Spirit of Prophecy quote, I don't, I don't remember. India. Yeah, well, yeah, so, so, okay, yeah, so basically the whole world has to buy into this. So, so there needs to be a breakdown of this division. So, so everybody has to become united. And, and so that's not going to happen just from one group, you know, the Republicans or something putting forward, you know, being, being in control of a majority in the government that they're going to bring about a Sunday law, right? Now, now we believe that there's going to be a civil war in the United States and, and there's going to be a lot attached to that. So these things have to happen first. And, and so we understand from the history that's, that's, being repeated we can look at this line upon line and we can see you know this this is not we're not expecting a sunday law in like three months or a year right it's just it's unrealistic because of what has to happen in prophecy plus also how the line is structured so you know we have trump as the fifth head of those seven heads in revelation 17 biden was the sixth the next one is going to be the seventh is going to be a civil war president. That's what we understand. And then the eighth is the papacy, right? So, so that's, that's how we understand it in our, in our study of the presidents of the United States and in connection with Daniel 11. So, so we can avoid a lot of the speculation. There's lots we don't know, but one thing we can know is that the events that are happening right now are not the Sunday law, right? That the Sunday law is not imminent. And, and so the fact that these sort of ideas have been around for a long time where people are looking at the headlines and making predictions, this is what we are is addressing. So he says, if you for some general, time, the general feeling has been around as long as I remember, even grade 12 class of 79 at CUC, we were sure that, Jesus was going to come within the next five years. Yeah. Now, yeah. and now Adventist leaders, scholarship or whatever, they're saying he's not going to come for a hundred years at least. <laughs> Putting it way off into the distant future. Yeah. No, no, we should always believe that, you know, that Christ is going to come soon. I mean, because he can. But, but when we're dealing with the events that, that are laid out, we know that there's events that have to happen, you know, before the close of probation, for instance. And, Part of that uh, as well is believing that could come, Christ could come for each of us today, you know, yeah. at our yeah. death, so to be prepared each day. Yeah. But, you know, we know we, in our understanding of the lines, we're not even to midnight yet, right? The midnight of the line where Jeff had in 2016 Nine eleven, midnight, midnight cry, Sunday law. We're not to that midnight yet. We're close. We're approaching it, but we're not to there. What so, kind of things mark mark it midnight? That we will we see it? Well, it's going to be a proclamation of a message, right? So the midnight cry is given, midnight, oh, right. and that hasn't been given. No. Right. Mm -hmm. So now it's going to be empowered. Then at the midnight cry, right? So at midnight, midnight cry, they're both the same way, Mark, but there's a giving of a message, the formalization of a message. And we can say that our message hasn't really been formalized. It hasn't been presented to the world, to the church. And so until that occurs, we haven't arrived at midnight. And then, of course, when that message is given, then there's a period of time until it is empowered. So somehow that message is given, then it's empowered. Now, you know, 
sort of Colin took the position, not exactly in this way, but basically that we were going to give this message that Trump was going to be the next president. He was going to become the president even before the election. And when that happened, that was, you know, that's the message we gave. And then, you know, it'd be empowered when he became president. Right. So, so he, you could probably put that within the midnight, midnight cry idea. And then the Sunday law would happen after that. The, the problem with that, with that thinking, of mm-hmm. course, is, that it was wrong, but also we didn't give the message, right? Like there's a little bit difference in us just talking amongst ourselves what what we think than actually the proclamation of the message to the world, right? Yeah, a remnant, a remnant, a remnant gives the message, and it's a lot more than ten or twenty people, right? And so, so I would just say, well, we haven't done, we haven't, we don't even have a message that we're agreed on. And, and we haven't given it. It's not been broadcast. And so that message can't do anything in le- until it's, it's given. And so we can say we're part of the development of that message as Samuel Snow, you know, was. If you're going to say this movement is Samuel Snow, it's been developing this message. And we can say that July 18th represents July 18th, 1844, when Samuel Snow's last letter is published prior to midnight. So we're in that period from midnight or from July 18th to midnight. We're in that period. That's, but, but we haven't given that message yet. And, and we don't have a time on when that's going to be. We just know that we have to do the work that's before us so that we can give that message. Like that's, that's what we believe, right? We, we believe that this message has to be given and how that's going to occur. We have no idea. I mean, we just know that we have to be faithful in the things God's given us to do here. Okay, so at first and for some time after its introduction to the Advent movement by Uriah Smith, the Eastern question was understood to refer to matters pertaining to Turkey in the Near East. Its present greater emphasis among us to the Far East is a more recent origin. So there's people who a place deal it with China and so forth, but that wasn't originally uh, the point. The Eastern question is not part of the original belief held by our pioneers. To the contrary, it is a counterfeit of their teaching. The early denominational view of Armageddon was expressed by James White in an editorial of the Review and Herald on January 21st, 1862. The great battle is not between nation and nation, but between earth and heaven. This was the teaching of this Advent people when the angel of God commissioned the Lord's servant to write, Said my accompanying angel, woe to him that shall move a block or stir a pin of these messages. His teaching was also included in the inspired message of the spirit of prophecy, which states, it is as certain that we have the truth as that God lives. In the Australian division, it has been declared that the king of the east referred to the nations of the Orient. This was definitely not a block or a pin of the message mentioned in the above extracts from Mrs. E.G. White, for this erroneous interpretation came in among us many years after those statements were made. The statement in early writings, page 252, was indeed made, indeed one made early in the Advent movement that found in volume four was first published in 1881. The guided pen wrote on November 27, 1883, the great way marks we have passed are immovable. These pillars of truth stand firm as the eternal hills, unmoved by all the efforts of men combined with those of Satan and his host. The truth given us after the passing of the time in 1844 are just as certain and unchangeable as when the Lord gave them to us in answer to our earnest prayers. We know what we have, have accepted is the truth. Not one pin is to be removed from that which the Lord has established. Where shall we find safety unless it be in the truths that the Lord has given for the last 50 years? Now, I would say that Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith, for the most part, is stating what was believed by Adventists. That is, we have this one bit, you know, 36 to 45, where there is a departure. But even then, he is expressing a view that Josiah Lich had. There's some changes, you know, and so the question is, well, if Ellen White endorsed the book on Thoughts on Daniel, why didn't she point out the problem regarding this? And now the question is that maybe Ellen White didn't have 
light to correct him at that time. Stephen sort of made that suggestion that it wasn't fully understood. So one is you're dealing with some of those prophecies are unfulfilled. Some are fulfilled. It seems like Ellen White could have simply said, you know, to Uriah Smith, you know, your view on 36 to, you know, to 45 is, you know, we obviously are dealing with the papacy here, not Turkey. You know, and that's what pe some people think that she should have done if it was error. And since she didn't do it, it must be true. But is that what Ellen White does? Does she go through and correct everything that Uriah Smith writes or that James White writes or anyone writes, even if she endorses what they're writing? Even if she endorses, you know, like Crozier's uh, article, which we're going to look at probably tomorrow. Like this one here. So we're going to look at this tomorrow. We won't look at it today because we only got 10 minutes. Okay, we'll just read a bit more here. These statements of confidence and certainty given by the Lord's servant refer to those truths given to this people in the early days of the Advent movement and use them as has been done to support the teaching which declares that a military conflict between East and West is portrayed or to use them as has been done to support the teaching which declares that a military conflict between East and West is portrayed in Revelation 16, verse 12 to 16, is a blatant misuse of inspired words. For this teaching arose in our minds within very recent years, long after those inspired words were penned. So we have here, let's say, endorsements. Ellen White's going to endorse Uriah Smith's thoughts on Daniel. She's going to endorse the views that were understood in the past. Now, does that mean that every single thing, every single detail of what we would call the pillars and the foundation is fully understood and that every little argument is correct? That is, can I go back to, you know, things that were written by James White and say he is then infallible? Everything that he says is correct. No. Okay. So why not? Why doesn't why doesn't her endorsement in in these things imply that everything is correct? What what's the problem there? Because when we talk about new light, new light's an unfolding of old light, and it doesn't reject the old; it makes it see, be seen clearer. That that could seem to be a contradiction because we we can find things that that James White taught or that you know Miller taught that that they're essentially correct, but there are some details that are wrong. So how do we address that? I mean, I've sort of addressed it a bit. What's the problem here about these endorsements? I mean, Ella White's not just contradictory. She's not mistaken. Isn't she really allowing people to reason for themselves? Okay, yeah. And so, but when we say that something is true, Right. That, you know, that we have the, the true view of the daily. For instance, all were reunited on the true view of the daily. Was everything that they taught in support of the daily being paganism and the abomination of desolation being papalism? Were all of their arguments correct? Not all of them. Not all of them. Right. So some of those things, as time went on, we, we refined them. Right. We could we could see some details that they couldn't see. And. A good example is when uh, Miller looks at, at Daniel chapter eight and says, you know, taken, taken away, that he doesn't recognize that that's a different word. He's just looking at the English there. He's not looking at the Hebrew. Then where it says, you know, from the time that the, the daily is taken away till the abomination of desolation is set up, right? In, in Daniel 11, 31 and uh, 12, verse 11, where it talks about the daily being taken away. And he compares that to Second Thessalonians. Those two match Second Thessalonians, but the one in chapter 8 doesn't, right? So we can look at it. We could say, well, you know, this is actually being lift up and exalted. It's not being removed in chapter 8, right? Because that's going to be room, where in the other ones it's served. Right, the Hebrew words. So Miller's not going to know that. And there's some other little arguments and little details here and there that, that Miller gets wrong. 
so we can sometimes have an idea of what you know, we, we have to be able to sort of define that. How do we decide that when we have new light, it's an unfolding of old light and it makes the old light shine brighter. That is, it makes it clearer. Some people could say, well, no, you're changing the truth, right? Your, your new interpretation is wrong because it disagrees with whatever, you know, somebody says about something, right? And, and we see this also, and, and we're going to look at that as well, some of the things that are said in uh, The True Midnight Cry. So, so people will say, for instance, in chronology, in The True Midnight Cry, uh, the first argument that Snow uses is the 6,000 years argument, right? And so he's going to say that the prophetic periods end, and he's going to use Miller's chronology that adds 153 years to ushers. So it's going to be 4157 BC that creation is supposed to occur. And that's going to end then in 1844. And so, you know, that's an argument that he makes. And we know that that's not correct. And so we've shown that. We've shown that that chronology of Miller's is incorrect. And so Snow uses that. So some people say, well, because Ellen White endorses the true midnight cry given by Snow, uh, then then we have to accept the, all of the arguments in Snow's article. But we also know that Snow is going to say things about when Jesus is baptized and, uh, you know, that that's not the beginning of the 70th week. He's not going to have the baptism of Christ as the beginning, right, which contradicts the spirit of prophecy. So we know that in an endorsement doesn't mean every detail. And so to take out that uh, Daniel 11, verse 36 to 45, and say that Ellen White should have clarified that, I'm going to endorse it except for that, or that she should have corrected um, Smith on his understanding of that passage, or that somehow this would discredit the whole book. It's not the main argument in the book. It's not the main line of prophecy. And, you know, so I, you know, so we're, we're going to have to deal with this, you know, this whole idea of endorsements um, so that we understand it. We have, you know, endorsements of, of many things that Ellen White endorses. Does that mean we agree with everything in there? Like even, even if you look at um, Pilgrim's Progress, you know, Ellen White says that that's a good book, right? Is everything in Pilgrim's Progress in agreement with Adventist understanding for those that have read it? I can't think of anything in particular, but uh, yeah, no. Now, there are there are some things in there that, that we wouldn't really agree with. I mean, obviously, the whole thing is, you know, having to deal with when you die and stuff, when you basically go to heaven. It, it's sort of an underlying idea there, which we wouldn't agree with. But it doesn't mean that she's going to say, well, the book shouldn't be read because there's lots of good things in that book. And it's it's an allegory and it's a Bible study, basically. But it doesn't mean that we have to agree with everything in Pilgrim's Progress. So she's also going to endorse these truths that we have as the pillars of our faith, the foundation. But does that mean that every single detail that we believed in the past is correct? There are things that as light unfolds that we see more clearly and that in a superficial analysis, we could say, well, they were wrong about some little detail or how they applied some verse. But it doesn't mean that we that they were wrong. Right. So people can be I mean, how right someone is. Is it's not a black and white thing. Right. Now, somebody can say, well, that's opening the door to all kinds of error. But if you have something like, let's say, feast keeping, where somebody says, well, Ellen White didn't have light on feast keeping. Well, we can see that that would be contrary to what was taught by the Adventists in a very basic way. Right. You, you can't you can't say that now we can keep the feasts because Ellen White just didn't have light on that or. Lunar Sabbaths, right? All kinds of different things. Or God does not kill, you know, or or different views on on the Holy Spirit and things like that. You you just can't you can't there's things that you can't reconcile 
as being an unfolding of light. They are a rejection of light. Amen. So that's that's one of the things we want to address in this next, you know, for the rest of this week. I, I really want to look at Crozier's article. I want to look at other endorsements that Ellen White has made. And so that we can understand what that means, because these are arguments that are used against this movement. And so any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study here. We just ask for your continued work of your Holy Spirit upon our hearts, that we can see how we can um, communicate with others, but mostly, Lord, how we can learn from you, that we can be converted, and that uh, when this happens, we know, Lord, that a power uh, can go forth to give a message to the world that's beyond our abilities, beyond our skills or knowledge or understanding. And so we give our hearts to you. We submit to you, uh, to your yoke, that we can learn of the meekness and lowliness of Christ. Be with each person. Bless them. May your angels watch over them, watch over our family, friends, loved ones, and those that we come in contact with. And bring us together again to study your word according to thy will. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I did want to add if the recording is still going on. Yes. Uh, okay. Just to say to D- David Thiel, if you're listening, we care about you. Mm-hmm. Please don't cut off communication. Yeah. You're loved. God loves you. Yeah, we, we're, we're definitely not an enemy of David Thiel's. And uh, yeah, so that's important. Thanks for that, Killian.